neither be dismayed at their looks. Though they be a rebellious house. Sometimes we can look at the names of God's prophets and we can see that they were named providentially without a doubt. Because Ezekiel means him whom the Lord strengthens. And Ezekiel was a prophet whom the Lord strengthened to preach to a rebellious house. And so on this side of the contest, we have Ezekiel. On this side of the contest, we have John Calvin, an uninspired man who lived from uh, 1509 to 1564, a French Protestant theologian. Now, when you see that term theologian, and I have uh, a lot of people say to me sometimes, well, that's your theology. Uh, that's, that's a certain uh, standpoint of theology. And that, that word theology or theologian is thrown around. Basically what that means, theo is the Greek word for God, and ology, almost any kind of ology, means the study of. And so you've got the study of God. But actually, what theology really means is false ideas about God. Because that's what men use. They throw up theology or different theologians here and there and everywhere to try and talk about false ideas about God. Now, if the ideas that we have about God, the understanding we have about God comes from this, I guess we could call that bibliology. But it's not theology. It is God's Word about God. Him. It's what the Bible says. We're not worried about this person's theology or that person's theology. We're worried about what the Bible says and doing what the Bible says. And so uh, Calvin was a French Protestant theologian. He was uh, uh, a central developer of what is called Reformed Theology. Now, there we go with theology again. Reformed Theology is referring to those uh, reformers that were trying to restructure the, the Catholic Church, trying to reform the corruptions in the Catholic Church, and the theology, the methodology they came up with of presenting God, as that word theology is, is referred to. And so he was a central developer of Reformed Theology. Theology. Now, Reformed theology came to be called Calvinism because he was the proponent of Calvinism. He was the one who uh, set forth this Reformed theology. Uh, he created a central hub in Geneva from which Reformed theology or Calvinism was propagated. And so uh, this uh, Calvinism went out from Geneva throughout Protestant denominationalism. Protestant denominationalism almost universally almost totally holds to some, uh, some form of Calvinism or another. When you look at Calvinism, you look at the ideas of Calvinism, and you look at Protestant denominationalism, they hold to some form of Calvinism. may not be what would be, I guess, the, the uh, Presbyterians would be the most purest of Calvinists, but all of Protestant denominationalism just about holds to forms of Calvinism to some degree or another. So, if Protestant denominationalism is so overwhelmed with Calvinism, then certainly we should be interested to see if Ezekiel, an inspired prophet of God, or John Calvin, an uninspired man, which one is right when we put them up next to each other? Well, of course, that's just silly, isn't it? We know an inspired prophet of God is going to outweigh an uninspired man. That's like uh, the, the uh, heavyweight champion going up against a uh, featherweight newcomer. It just wouldn't work, would it? Well, we can look at their teachings and we can see that Calvinism is summarized as TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. Now, Calvin himself never uh, used this term, TULIP, for his teaching. That is a, a summary term that was applied to his teaching, and it does accurately represent his teaching. This word TULIP summarizes Calvin's doctrine, and so that's what we want to look at this morning. The T is total depravity. Total depravity means, uh, and I'll just read it right out of the encyclopedia, also called radical depravity and total inability. I'm going to read it over here. Uh, and total inability. This point means that every person is corrupt and sinful throughout, uh, or, uh, throughout in all of his or her faculties, including the mind and will. Thus, no person, now pay attention here, no person is able to do what is truly good in God's eyes, but rather everyone does evil all the time. As a result of this corruption, man is enslaved to sin, rebellious, 
and hostile toward God, blind to truth, and notice it, unable to save himself or even prepare himself for salvation. That's the idea of total depravity. That's the uh, encyclopedic definition of total depravity. Total depravity is the fallen state of man as a result of original sin. Well, now, if the idea of total depravity has for its basis the idea of original sin, and original sin is false, which we shall see, then the idea of total depravity is false. Wouldn't that follow? Absolutely. Well, let's go on. This is Calvin's side of the argument. Now let's look at Ezekiel's side of the argument. Well, what about original sin? What does Ezekiel say about original sin? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? What does it mean? Why are you saying this? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. And so what follows throughout the rest of Ezekiel is to show why this proverb is false. Why he says, don't use this proverb. Now the proverb says, the uh, fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The, the son's teeth are set on edge. Well, that means that the sons are bearing the consequences of what the father did. Original sin, inheriting sin. Sin is passed from father to son. And he says, don't use this proverb. It's not true. It's not a, uh, a truthful saying. And so to the idea of original sin, the whole chapter of Ezekiel 18 is given to refute the idea of original sin. Notice he goes on in verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Well, what does that have to do with original sin? Does that mean that I'm going to die in sin because of my father? Or does that mean because of me? I'm going to die in my own sins if I don't uh, receive remission of sins. Not my father's sins. Verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now notice, I, you know, sometimes the Bible is so explicit that if you just have to scratch your head and wonder, where did this guy come up with his ideas? Because it says right here, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. How much clearer could it be? And yet Calvin has it. Total depravity, original sin, there it is. But this is what Ezekiel says. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, the whole point there is personal responsibility. I'm going to give account to God for what I do, not for what anybody else does. You're going to give account to God for what you do, not for anybody else. That's the point that Ezekiel is making here. Don't say that proverb. It's not true. You're going to give account for yourself, not for your fathers. Notice he goes on. We, we'll just strike out original sin. We can see it's false. Well, what about unable to save yourself? Uh, the whole idea of total depravity is based on original sin and the idea that you are unable to save yourself. Well, let's look and see what it says. Ezekiel 18 and verse 5. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, verse 14, Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Well, that sounds like something he's doing, doesn't it? That sounds like something that he is doing to save himself, doesn't it? Notice, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. Well, why, why have I highlighted these words, do, doeth not, uh, half, 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 that's talking about our activity, what we do. But Calvin says, oh no, you're unable to do anything. 
you can't do anything.